Welcome to Run With It, the podcast that brings you business ideas from established entrepreneurs. Each episode, you'll hear a new business idea and the exact steps our guest would take to get started. Follow through and you can earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Here are your hosts, Chris Justin and Ethan Janney. I'm Chris Justin. And I'm Ethan Janney. And on today's show, we have Jules Schroeder. Ranked by Inc. Magazine as number one of the top 27 female entrepreneurs changing the world in 2017 and one of the top 40 millennials to follow in 2018, Jules Schroeder is a musician and visionary on a mission to inspire people to create a life by their own design. With this vision, Jules created Unconventional Life, a Forbes column and a top-ranked podcast for entrepreneurs that features the stories of millennials living from this new paradigm. Unconventional Life has reached millions of people from over 75 different countries and has become a global community of like-minded entrepreneurs, influencers, creatives, and thought leaders. Jules herself has always been multi-passionate as an avid crossfitter, yoga teacher, musician, singer, writer, and traveler, and overall life enthusiast. Jules, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome. It's good to be here with you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Yeah, we're very excited. You've got this very cool business with Unconventional Life. It's uh, it's inspiring. It's impressive what you're doing. And we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. Unconventionally, our podcast is a little different as well. <laughs> Rather than have you share that story as the primary part of the episode, we're going to have you share a completely new business idea with our listeners that you've been so generous to offer to them and our listeners are encouraged to follow through on the action steps that we're going to talk about and run with them. So let's get into it and uh, ask you to tell us about the business idea that you have today. Yeah. So uh, I think I was in Bali maybe about a month ago and uh, was literally uh, just finished a CrossFit class. And if anyone's ever been to Changu, Bali, it's like <laughs> CrossFit on steroids. I don't know what they do there, but those classes are <laughs> so intense. But I was lying in my own pool of sweat at the end of the class, like basically dying on the floor. And this idea came to me, uh, which was basically um, called In the Dark, which is pulling back the curtain on entrepreneurs and top performers' mental health and actually creating a community and really a business on, you know, what does it take to really understand what's happening for, you know, all of these um, people and individuals. And I think for myself, and I look at so many of us, this dream of create a life by your own design, you know, write your own hours, have this freedom-based lifestyle, and all those things are great. But what I've seen in my work and what I've also seen in myself is that you then do all the right things in this new way, yet you get there and still that feeling of being unfulfilled or that, you know, something isn't totally right, like is still with you. And if anything, the gap becomes bigger because you're like, I created the business. I can be my own boss. Like I did all the right things, but why is there something still missing? And I feel like that side of the story isn't really told. And I watch so many people hit these lows and these dips and that conversation isn't being had. So this business idea is to basically create a platform for that uh, conversation to be had via various um, product offerings, a documentary series, and then other little things are floating, but it's it's fresh. Like I said, it's a month ago, so we can round table discussion um, the idea if we'd like. Going to be a triangle table just because we have three, but for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions we usually go to right away is, "What's the problem?" And I think that there's a lot of emotional kind of problem here or pain or, that's kind of emerging as a clear part, and and maybe something that actually attracts people to want to be involved. Can you give a little bit more detail on? how you see the problem that that this business will address for people? Sure. So, you know, when I first started on conventional life, you know, I really had this idea of basically telling stories to give permission to, you know, create life by their own design. And when I first started writing for Forbes in 2016, like the unconventional life, I actually had to explain the concept. And now it's like the unconventional life, like, duh, <laughs> great, we get it, you know? And so for me, that new conversation was what drove everything. And I think at the time, you know, when I started my entrepreneurial journey in, you know, 2011 or so, um, there really weren't many examples of entrepreneurship. And so when I think flash forward, here we are coming into 2020, I think there's been a lot of proof of concept that, yeah, there's now a million and one ways to make money in the world coming back to your guys' show, right? Like let's generate infinite business ideas that for those of you tuning in can spark something in yourself or take something we say and run with it. 
Um, but I find inside of that, we're not addressing who you have to become um, and, and what happens um, underneath that process. And, you know, there aren't, at least in my own experience, if you look at suicide rate, for example, in terms of young people, the highest suicide rate between eight is between eight to 11 year olds. And I think it's because we have more stimulus, more information, more this has to have been done like yesterday in us, driving us. But I feel like we're not stopping to slow down enough to actually say, well, if I really want to create something sustainable and I do want to do all these things and have freedom and all this stuff that the benefits come from, then who am I at the end of the day when I go to bed? And what kind of relationships do I have with the people close to me? And man, like if I can't get that sale or hit that number or if I'm in debt, like, am I okay? And that education, I feel like in a lot of ways, we've been in the wild, wild west. We're creating things on the fly. We're literally inventing as we go, yet um, and we, we're changing. Like the things we as human beings need are changing. And there's a new thing of how do we human, how do we learn basic fundamental human skills in 2020 that really our parents or say, you know, in, in a conventional job structure, you didn't need to know how to rock it out with uncertainty. You didn't need to know... <laughs> how to stare fear in the face and act anyways. You didn't need to know how to navigate your nervous system when you're overstimulated. And so I think those are components that um, not only I think are are important, but I think they're going to become fundamental requirements as we move forward into more of this collaboration and creation that we're doing. If we don't address these things, we're already seeing the implications and the impact. And I feel like um, there's a big heart in it. And I know it's alive in my heart and I've seen it in many others as well. So very much what I think uh, there's some some pain there to use the <laughs> the terminology of uh, of the idea so it, it seems like this is something that has become bigger in public consciousness definitely not to the extent that it needs to be I think Ethan and I both are I don't want to speak too much for you Ethan but believe what you're saying we agree with you that this is a, a big for sure issue that it's it's something that is maybe the biggest impediment to entrepreneurship is the mental mental side of things. I wonder whether that's just because we're in it so much that we see that more clearly than uh, than someone who is maybe thinking about entrepreneurship, but they don't believe that this is really a problem. What's your sense on the percentage of people out there who would agree with you that this is, yes, this is something that I should invest some time to improve or no, nah, I don't care about that. I want to, I know that once I get my business to the point that I want to get it to, then all that stuff is going to take care of itself. Yeah, totally. Well, I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of reframing the conversation. So if we think about mental health, like I don't even love that word, right? In the sense that I think that's where we've historically been, such as like, it's like categorizing like, oh, you must feel anxious or you must deal with depression or you must, you know, have a thing. Rather, I think it's a new set of skills that we need in in this new century Um, to literally learn how to human, like emotional resiliency, for example, or, you know, how do you um, be with uncertainty and how to actually have confidence in in those different things. Um, And so I think that there's a universal toolkit that I'm seeing, whether you're agreeing or not, chances are, if you're listening to this and you're in, you know, your own nine to five, if you're listening to this, it's probably because there's something missing. And that something it's like no one else can see in my experience. It's like, you know, people in your life, they look at your life and they're like, wow, your life looks so good. And inside, you know, something feels wrong. And you're like, well, crap, if everyone says it looks good, why do I still go to bed? Or why do I still tune into a podcast like this? Or why do I, you know, still do this thing um, to try to understand what that is? And yet you can feel like the lone wolf a lot of the times. And, or you're constantly having to explain yourself to people in your life or people just don't get you. And so that conversation, I feel like is happening universally, whether you identify with, yeah, this could be a pitfall for me of mental health or not, or like, actually, I feel rocking it and inspired. I think there are a new um, set of tools that you'll need in order to get from where you are to where you want to be. And basically, like, how do you reconcile that feeling of incompletion in yourself, whether you're associating it to if I just have that business then that feeling will resolve itself. Or then you create that business and you talk to so many successful entrepreneurs that have created that business. And then they realize the feeling still didn't resolve themselves or they, you know, made the money that they wanted to make and then boom. And so that resolution I find in my experience only happens internally. And so I would say, ask yourself for those people, what's the very thing that even has you interested in this conversation? And chances are whether you classify it as quote mental health or not, 
that thing is pinging you enough to want to even participate. And that's the thing I'm really speaking to. Mm-hmm. I'll just throw in there. I think I really, I appreciate this conversation a lot because it's something I get really excited about. And that is the edge. I feel like we're talking about the edge here. And it's easy to talk about the edge of technology. Oh, what's the next technology that's coming up? And, you know, some people may be right. It may be cryptocurrencies or whatever people want to talk about. But it's like the edge of human, right? Like you're saying. And I really, I really appreciate conversations like these because people aren't thinking about it so consciously, the majority of people, but they're going to be forced to. That these are the type of things where the future is coming to us, whether we like it or not. And I feel like I recognize the same trend of the emotional complexity of living in not just the world of today, which is already complex, but the world of a few years from now, it's going to be pretty intimidating and it's going to require work and and new knowledges and new paradigms and things like that. Yeah. And just to add to that, like corporations are investing more money into wellness, into these types of programs than they ever have. You know, I have friends that, you know, one of them has this thing called um, ART, which is authentic relating training, which is basically a communication, you know, practice. You guys are getting hired by Google, Facebook, like they can't create enough demand to match um, the desire in corporations. And so I think that's one of the fastest growing markets for anyone that's listening to this. If you want to create programs that are basically bettering, you know, the emotional component or the well-being component, it's like corporations have finally caught on and that's where there's a ton of money to be had. So let's talk through the nuts and bolts of this, maybe. Uh, the How would you turn this desire, this problem that you're seeing into a business? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, the first thing um, that I do, there's a lot of ways, you know, to kind of take it. But for me, one of the things that I love is live experiences. And so if I always ask myself, what are my distinct natural assets? Or another way to say it, it's like, what's in my DNA? What are all the different things, the components that I do that I can bring to the table? So for myself, like I look at what's my distinct natural assets. I'm really great at creating transformational experiences. I'm awesome at combining the arts with them. So whether that's like playing my ukulele or music or speaking, those things go really great for me. And I love like in-person connection. And so if I look at those components and someone that's hearing this, you can ask yourself, what are those things in yourself? I like to think about, well, what kind of stew or what kind of vehicle can I then create based on those things? So if I look at this problem, I would basically say, cool, well, it makes sense for me to create some kind of training that would be in-person that I could then offer to uh, support people in this. And I'd probably start with some kind of beta training type of thing, but I would go after uh, corporations, uh, particularly those, you know, that are innovative in the sense, whether it's like your, you know, your Twitter, your Google, or your Facebook, but even companies like Coca-Cola and PepsiCo. I just had a friend close a deal for, you know, half a million dollars last week on, um, she's got this thing called the feel good scale. Where literally she teaches you how to operate your business from the green zone. So for those that are skeptical listening to this, like companies are paying real money to um, have these concepts. So I would uh, start off by creating a little in-person experience, probably a three-day type of training where um, I could take people through a process using some kind of methodology um, around creating some kind of support or solution around it, and then I would pitch it to different uh, corporations as like a beta group. And usually you. Can it are on average around 10 grand or so, 10 to 20 grand US um, for each like three day workshop, depends on how many employees. But that's probably one way that I could consider starting. Mm, I like that as a suggestion. And, and what do you just from your experience, because it sounds like you've heard of similar situations, if it is a 10, 20 grand thing, what do you think is the range of the number of participants that you're going to have to plan to deal with? Is it 10 to 20? Is it 200, 100 to 200? or I think it varies. It depends on how you set it up. Just for those hearing it, when you are pitching corporate, uh, you can do it either per person, like if you're doing like a two to 500 person thing, which just as someone who's hosted these experiences like all over the world, that's a shit ton of people. <laughs> so just like heads up there. Um, <laughs> don't underestimate the value of uh, human power. But yeah, I would say on average, you know, you're looking probably at about like 20 to 25 people max for that price. And for someone listening who buys into this idea, but they don't necessarily have the experience either in putting together events 
or in uh, this skill in itself, what would they do to get started? Yeah, great idea. So first thing that comes to mind is you can literally host a virtual summit. And what I love about virtual summits is it's a great way if you have no credibility, no experience, no you know influence in that market, and also just a curiosity, like, is this interesting to you? One of the things that I uh, adopt, I call it rapid visioning. It's the idea of literally prototyping in real time and then letting your environment give you feedback before you actually turn it into a business. Said another way, like I've done a Facebook post for women that I basically said, hey, I want to host like bucket list experiences. Is anyone interested? Literally, I got like 150 comments and generated an $80,000 revenue stream in three days off of one Facebook post. And I didn't even like plan on turning that into a business. It was just like, hey, I know that this thing's kind of like alive in my world. I don't know if it's any good or not. And then when I saw like 150 plus comments come in, I literally had like men messaging me like, are you doing a mastermind? Like, are you doing this thing? Like, can we get involved? There seems to be a lot of traction. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm just like trying to see if anyone wants to come hang out with me somewhere in the world so I can have more friends. <laughs> but like, this was a few years ago. Um, so anyway, so that idea of validation, I think is really important. Um, and how you could do it with this is you could host an online summit. And let's say you're taking it, you know, in the sense of, um, mental health, for example, the summit could be based around mental health. For me, what I've thought about doing is actually having 25 or so experts who aren't actively talking about mental health, like people that you would hear that you look up to that you're like, whoa, this person's incredible. Like Greta Thunberg was one person I considered the climate activist. Like, wow, this woman is like, you know, this girl is like out there really crushing it. But then actually having them on the interviews, peel back the curtain and actually see what they're dealing with and being like, whoa, you too, so that it creates like an even deeper sense of permission. So you could essentially reach out to 20 some people, say you're hosting an online summit based around whatever topic that is, and then use the recordings as something that either you could sell. So you could sell a ticket to the recordings or lifetime access to the recordings. And then also by proxy, you would start to get known in the space as someone who is influential in that market. If you did it in cryptocurrency, for example, you know you then host a cryptocurrency summit. And the next thing you know, you are by association being associated with all these names. And then you can turn that asset, those recordings and those things into a product and then sell it or go to a corporation and be like, hey, I just hosted this summit. Here's kind of my experience in doing it, like 45 minute interviews. And then they look at it and they're like, oh, this person's credible. Or, oh, wow, okay, I've got you know what, what I need to validate them. So that could be another avenue um, that would be really easy to get started. And all you really need to do is like, I've done a few of these summits is you just send a few cold emails out and just say, hey, like I've got an idea to put on a summit about cryptocurrency or I've got an idea to put on a summit about mental health. Um, would you want to be interviewed? And I find people love talking about themselves. <laughs> people love being interviewed. And so it's a pretty, in my experience, um, an easy yes, um, if someone really believes in the idea and it's a fit for them to say yes, and then can leverage their influence um, to amplify the collective goal that you're trying to achieve. To define online summit, that's typically maybe a, a three-day event where all these experts come in and talk about a topic and people have access to that for free during that window. And at the end of that, if they want to have access to the recordings for life, they have to pay some amount, correct? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and into addition to that, you then are building an email list in the process because people have to register for free into the summit. And then you start to build an email list that after the summit, you can then promote and sell like-minded offers. So let's say you want to host a small virtual mastermind after you could then sell it to the email list. Or let's say you don't have any products, but you find an affiliate, someone who essentially has a product that would fit in and you say, hey, I'd love to share this product with this email list. And then they pay you a commission based on the products that are sold. So there's a few different ways to do it, um, but it can catapult uh, a business in and of itself. Right. Uh, before I wanted to make the comment that I think a lot of people don't realize that when you do a project like this, like you said, you can start out with little credibility in a space and you gain credibility by having these other people who have the credibility involved in your project. And I think one of the sort of naive perspectives there is, oh, well, it's almost like it's cheating, right? You, don't ha you still don't have any credibility. You're just using these people's credibility. But I think that what's not obvious, if you haven't done something like this, 
is just by getting to know these people, you gain credibility, actual credibility in that field. Because they, one thing that I've noticed about experts, like you said, they like talking about themselves, but if you're, and what they're working on, usually more what they're working on than themselves. But if you're engaging with them out, even outside of these live aired classes or lectures they give, they're going to be talking your ear off about what they care about. And so you won't, you won't help, but become an expert, you know? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) totally. It's like the fastest education program. And, you know, when I started Unconventional Life, the very first event, it was also supposed to be a passion project. It was never supposed to be a business. Um, But I literally had a dream, like if the actual dream, (laughs) saw 30 people gathering and Bali were the first words out of my mouth. And I had no idea how to do live events. I really had no desire. I had no experience. I had no list, no audience. And in seven weeks, I sold out the first event in Bali. And I remember my dad, who worked Wall Street in New York City, he was like, you're going to convince how many people to pay you how much to fly where and what amount of time? Like, have you lost your mind? <laughs> we have people in our lives all the time that are like, are you like batshit crazy? Like, what is going on here? But lo and behold, I decided to, um, you know, have five people that had had it influence that just believed in me as a person that I'd met over the years who were experts in their various fields. And by leveraging them um, and their belief in what my vision was for the event, you know, we sold it out in seven weeks and that was just by proxy. And I was really nobody in that space. And then that, you know, has turned into this huge international brand. Um, so it can definitely happen in, in various different configurations, both ritual, but also, you know, that's very much how I did, um, how I created unconventional life too. So. This is cool because we are kind of getting back around to the uh, initial thing that you brought up, which is it's not so much the the skills, like you don't need to learn a bunch of SEO or how to become a programmer in order to start businesses today. A lot of times it's uh, taking a leap into the unknown, trying something that you don't know whether it's going to work. And people who are mentally healthy and resilient uh, are much more likely to do that. Or you might be called crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you feel like you're batshit crazy and really excited, you're either totally onto something or not. <laughs> but I think it's a good indicator. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, one thing I wanted to raise about this, I think it'll be very inspirational to people listening, is that with projects like this, there's a sort of we need you to do this type of ethos that comes across, right? When people are hesitant about doing something like following a vision or especially this particular business idea, I think this is needed. And so if people are hesitating about doing it, they need to think less of their own fears and know that that people, more people need to take these steps and start things because they are required to do that to help the rest of us figure out, you know, whatever aspect of being a human, as you put it, that they're going to be able to help us do, right? Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, in in a lot of ways, whether it's this particular concept that you want to run with, like what are the fundamental skills that we need, right? Like of learning how to human in terms of the 2020 vision, or whether it's something else that is really like alive on your heart, like you could use that or you could use something else. I often find it's the thing that nags you that actually ends up being like you kind of create the ship or you create like the, the vision for those that you're meant to impact. Like I personally wanted to hear more stories of people doing life differently because I knew I didn't want to go work a corporate job. That wasn't like my end all path in life. Yet I couldn't find that many people at that time that could. So I was like, I'm just going to tell a bunch of stories and then I'll like figure it out. And I'm just going to interview people and I'm going to listen. And then that, you know, birthed the whole thing. And so um, for this particular thing that now this had a human, these emotional resiliency, like what are these skills are important to me now? Um, But I think for those hearing this, like asking yourself, like, what's that thing? And chances are the people or who your audience would be um, that you're meant to, you know, impact or sell to or become your clients, oftentimes can be reflective of your own process. And what's the thing in yourself that you're trying to solve or fulfill? Or what's the pain that's agitating you or the thing that annoys you um, is often, in my experience, a good place to look. That makes a lot of sense. It sounds like this is something that comes naturally to you, or at least that you've practiced for a very long time, asking these sorts of questions of yourself, being open to these new ideas. I'm picturing some people out there who, who want to do something like this, who, who love what you've created and just can't see themselves taking that next step. 
or sitting down and, and creating like a vision board or whatever it else. Not that you shared that example, but something, like what is it? What would you say to someone who's out there, who's open to shifting their mindset around this, but uh, doesn't even know what questions to ask, doesn't know how to interrupt their everyday patterns? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, for me, like, I really believe things happen in the medium and, and said another way. I find that I create by proxy of getting more data. And the only way I get more data is to be on the court. You know, if you think about like a basketball game, for example, like the coach can't like, he can pre, you know, idea the plays that he'll make, but you got to be in the game in order to actually know what's going to move the ball forward or move the needle. And so for me, my philosophy is like iterate first, tweak as I go, get more data, tweak as I go. And I call that process I said earlier, you know, rapid visioning, but it's really a way I have never found in my own experience that I'm going to get the courage to just like jump unless I just like put my foot in the water or put my toe in the water. And so for someone that's hearing this, I ask yourself, like, oftentimes we think the step we need to take is like a step 10 or step 100. So the gap of where you are now to even being in the game feels so big that you literally have to muster up all the courage to then have the perfect business plan to then have the one conversation. And if that doesn't go right, then man, everything is squashed and like everything falls flat again. Or like, I'm going to listen to a thousand of these podcasts on repeat and maybe then I can put myself in the game. When I find the only way the information comes is actually in the medium itself. And so said another way, like you have to just put yourself in. And I always like to ask myself, what's the most natural and instinctive like first step? So for example, let's say you've got an idea, you want to run with this idea of, you know, pulling back the entrepreneur's mental health type of thing. Like the very first step I could do is I literally, which, which is actually what I did. I put a post up on Facebook and said, Hey, I'm thinking about doing a series called in the dark, pulling back the curtain on entrepreneurs, mental health. Is anyone interested in this like idea? And literally I had 80 comments of people that were like, Whoa, this is really cool. And people started tagging friends. And for me, that was the first step of putting myself in the game. And so one of the things anyone can do listening to this is have a conversation. It could be online, like on Facebook or on LinkedIn or some other platform of your choice, or it could just be with a friend of yours, or it could be with a family member where you actually just say, Hey, I've got this idea. I don't know if it's any good or not, but what, what do you think? And I find from there, you'll get two things. One, you'll experience how it lands. So like the external feedback, either people will be like excited or not excited or whatever. And two, you get to see how you feel in sharing that. So many times, like I've thought something was great and it's come out of my mouth and then it's just fallen flat. And I think if we relate to this, it's like a time where you like, you say something and you're like, Oh, I didn't feel that good. And that for me is also another indicator of, okay, either I need to keep digging or keep tweaking, or actually maybe this thing isn't that exciting to me. Maybe you guys run with this idea and you're like, wow, actually that's cool, but that's not, you know, my highest excitement. So I find those two things at least puts you in the game. And then from there, you know, ask yourself, well, what's the next logical step? You know, what's the next logical step? And maybe from that Facebook group, or sorry, that Facebook post, then I could have then made a Facebook group and said, hey, wow, all these people are interested in this conversation. Who would like to be in a Facebook group to continue it in a more, you know, intimate way? And then I could create a Facebook group. And then I could then create, you know, a, a product that says, wow, all these people are in my group. Who would like to sign up for a seven day challenge where we practice emotional resiliency and it's going to cost $50. And then I could see those people that then sign up. So it's very much staying present step by step by step. Um, but I will say that the only way to get the data is you have to be in the medium. Like you will not get from where you are now to where you want to be conceptualizing. Literally no masterful playbook in football, basketball, any sport can like play out their expertise until the game starts, until the clock begins. So you have to ask yourself, what's the very, very smallest natural instinctive thing that you can do to put your toe in the water to get yourself on the court so that you can start moving and only then can you start to apply any of these things and then my opinion you'll really get going i like this because you know we focus on action steps and you know you've gone on to the larger level whether it's approaching a corporation for a three-day event or just talking with a family member and i like that we can give that to to people or a friend right we can give that to people as an action step that can suit your level. 
it could just be taking the idea, putting it out there, talking it through with someone and seeing how it lands. I'll add that and I'll see, ask if you agree with this. Sometimes if it's overwhelmingly scary to do, then maybe it's not the thing to do. But if it's slightly scary, it often is the right next step to take. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I find that in my life as well. And I find if it feels overwhelming, chances are what your step is, is not clear enough. Meaning I find when I get overwhelmed or I see others that I've coached or worked with get overwhelmed, it's because the step isn't clear. Like it's not like direct, like picking up the phone and calling a family member, really clear step. (laughs) Being like, I'm going to host retreats somewhere in the world and I have no idea where in the world and all those things. There's like a million first steps, not clear enough, definitely a cause for overwhelm. (laughs) So I think being specific and clear on a micro step um, is all of it. And I do think for me, when I get those nervous, excited, holy shit, I'm crazy flutters, that's my telltale. Like, okay, keep going. Um, when I'm overwhelmed, I'm like, all right, I'm biting off too big of a bite here. Joel, step back, get a little bit more specific, get a little bit more clear, start smaller, and then I'll feel that access to uh, get in the game. I'm picturing someone right now sitting at their computer, typing out a Facebook post about something that they're passionate about. And this is something that I, I love that you bring up Facebook because it's something that anyone can have access to. It's free and there's almost no friction to it except for the mental fear associated with saying something stupid or being called out or what is that person going to think about me? So as they're sitting there typing this out and they're waffling, you know, their hands wavering over the enter key. I know sometimes when I'm in that situation, I I think to myself like F it <laughs> just hit <laughs> press it. Is that what you is that what it really comes down to? Cause or is there some some other way to to soften that blow? I mean, I think at the end of the day, like yeah, it comes down to actually hitting the button. But I think the bigger thing is like you have to ask yourself, like, is the cost you know, this is something I ask myself all the time. I just actually ended a relationship two months ago because the cost of staying where I was was becoming greater than the uncertainty of where I was going. And so like, you have to ask yourself, if you don't press the button, if you don't hit send, is the cost of you thinking about that, God knows how many hours you've already been thinking about that. Like, is the cost of that circle, that tape, like, you know, that's eating you up for hours in your day and your life. Like, is that cost greater than actually what could happen if you just press send? And you might hear this and be like, yeah, you know, or no, it isn't actually what could happen if I press send is way worse. But I think I ask myself that question a lot, you know, like, you know, what, what really, what's the greater impact here? (laughs) Like I can stay where I am and I'm stuck and I'm sure exactly where I am, or I can hit send and then I go into the unknown and like, it's who knows what's over there. Right. And so at least I don't know what's over there. Um, but at the end of the day, like you guys are hearing this, like, just do it. Like, and here's the other thing, like you can do it and you can take it back and create again. And I think many of us, We get so worked up that the action is the end all action. And once it's there, we can never go back and blah, blah, blah. And I think the truth is, is you can keep creating like in a conversation, you can say something and it doesn't come out right. And then you're like, "Uh, can I just delete all that and try again? And there's always the ability to just do it again. And so if you don't like it, like if you get anxiety, I've done this before. I've literally written posts and then I've deleted them 10 minutes later. Because I'm like, no one's commented. There's not one like. No one gives a shit. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, you can just delete it. And then you can try again. Um, but that's if I can offer anything. Just give a little bit of play to this as well. Like, at the end of the day, like, we make things so heavy and significant. And then, I mean, they matter. But at the same time, like, you know, there's always an opportunity in the next moment, in the next moment, in the next moment to iterate and, and do it again. And so um, it doesn't have to be so hard or heavy. Um, so I don't know. I always like to say, do the opposite. So if you actually hitting the enter key and walking the other room is like something new, then, then do that. Um, and just, yeah, notice what shows up. That's actually a good point too. If you always are posting Facebook posts (laughs) about (laughs) about your crazy business ideas and nobody's ever responding, then maybe there's something else you should be doing. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) That was something I did want to bring up just to give people perspective, you know, like you said, oh, you post a post and then there's a bunch of likes and there's all this engagement. So I can envision somebody saying, all right, cool, I'm going to do it. And then they make a post and they don't get any response. And then they go, okay, well, this is not working out. So I like you also just inadvertently gave a piece of what to do in that case. You gave an indication basically that there's a quantity aspect to this. And, you know, 
sometimes those things aren't don't hit those ideas that you post and you can delete it or you can ignore it but you definitely don't have to take it as give up time right is that a good message yeah absolutely and i mean i think at the end of the day um it's like practicing non attachment there's a lot of things like it's really great to be committed to something but totally unattached in how it shows up and so in the sense like if you really got an idea that you love don't let it just be the thing that you let it die because if you let it die you might not be that committed to it but rather consider it as feedback of man maybe my idea could be more specific or maybe there's another way i could say it more clear if you're just like i want to help human consciousness evolve as anyone interested in that idea people would probably not comment because it's so vague they'd be like what does that actually mean for example versus like I'm interested in interviewing 10 experts who have worked in Africa, who have helped, you know, X, Y, and Z people. Are you interested? It becomes more easier to say yes to it. And so, um, so I always like to say, just use it as data and as feedback and, and you're, you're tweaking and tuning rather than it's personal. And uh, I really believe that being in that unattached place, it's where you can allow the unexpected to happen. Maybe no one comments on it, but then someone sends you a message a week later and they're like, hey, I saw that post that you wrote and it really touched me and I'd love to introduce you to X, Y, and Z. And that's happened to me before too. I'm like, wow, 200 people saw this video or like actually no one commented, but then it comes back around. And so life is not linear in my opinion. And um, you just never know how things will ripple out. And so being in that unattached place allows that natural, um, unexpected form to, to take place too. I think it'd be valuable to circle back to some other ways that this original idea could manifest. You mentioned the virtual summit, which I think that's a, a brilliant way to approach this because it solves the two-pronged problem of you're not an expert in that field and you never put together live events. So it may be challenging to come up with something else that's on that order of, of a good... <laughs> angle for this, but uh, we can kick around a couple other ideas. Anything else come to mind for you? Yeah. I mean, I think another way, if you didn't want to do a whole online summit is you could create like a, you know, people are really into like seven day or 30 day challenges. So you could create a 30 day, you know, mental health, pulling back the curtain on mental health uh, challenge that people could sign up for. And you could share about it on Facebook or LinkedIn or with friends or whoever. And essentially decide, you know, uh, to drum up a whole email list of, of signups. Or maybe you just did it on Facebook and you put everyone into a Facebook group that wanted to be a part of it. And then for 30 days, you just released an email or you released a video about it. So you engaged people with free content that either you could create or let's say you're not an expert at it. And you bring in, you know, five people and they end up giving the content or whatever it might be. Um, and then from there you can then sell a product if you'd like. So you could you know, have a free content and then use that list to then sell a product to either your own product or if you're like, I don't have any product, then you could even use one of those speakers and offer to partner with them and get a percentage for sales on their product. So that could be another way to approach it as well, at least in terms of the, the online space. I don't know how well this is going to how much this is in other people's minds. Honestly, as, as a listener, if this is something that I, I don't have a good gauge for um, how bought in people are to this need for mental health resiliency. And, and I know that I brought this up. I'm, I'm coming back to it because it's sticking with me here of uh, what, what is the hard part here? And I wonder whether the hard part is in actually convincing people that, that they need this. And I would have said 10 years ago, definitely, definitely. That's the hard part today. Again, being, doing the type of things that we do, I think we're more immersed in, in this belief that in this knowledge that yes, this is very important. But let's say, rather than speculate about the, uh, the people out there, what percentage of them do believe in what don't, how would you onboard people who maybe are at a corporation, and their boss makes them sign up for an event like this, and they're just kind of sitting in the corner, arms folded, what type of things do you do to get someone like that engaged? Yeah, totally. Um, oh, I think it's twofold. I want to actually address the first part of what you didn't fully ask as a question. And then I want to answer your question. What I do want to say is that 
I think that, you know, one thing that I've, how I've gotten really successful is I've, I've been really specific about who, what I'm speaking for is for like, and you, we've maybe some of you've heard this term, but niche down and really find out where are my people and recognizing I'm not for everyone. I don't actually want to be for everyone. This idea isn't for everyone, but it's really for those that it's for. Like I'm clear that like there's a very specific demographic of entrepreneurs or those that have been in this freedom-based lifestyle, maybe a little bit further in their entrepreneurial journey, um, or they've been in, you know, a corporation for a number of years and have hit a threshold where they already know inside of them, they already can identify with that pain. Like I can talk about that gap that no one can see. And they're like, oh shit, she's talking to me. And like those people, I'm, I'm, it's for. And for anyone else that's like, oh, I don't resonate with that or I don't ever awesome. This isn't necessarily for you or for you yet. And so for me and for anyone listening to this, it's really important to get clear on exactly who it's for. And I think another way to do that is you just talk to people and you listen to what they say and let that be evidence for how you know, essentially. And so for me, I focus my time on that. And I think for those hearing this, it's important to focus your time on your super fans or those that it's really for people that you like say it and they're like, oh my gosh, someone finally can see what I'm dealing with. And so if I go to say this person, I'm dead at a corporation, he's been forced to do this. He's not really, or she's not really into it. And they're having to do it anyways. How do you engage them? I, I think it's, it's a both. And I'm a big believer of not necessarily trying to force or push my ideas onto other people, but rather look at, well, what is it that's causing that person to shut down? And I usually find when someone's shut down to something or when I'm shut down to something, one of two things is happening. Either one, they're triggered and it's actually touching something in themselves, meaning that they're like, wow, there's something there to look at and I'm triggered and there's value of exploring, or it's just not relevant to where they're at in that moment. And that's okay too. And so I don't actually, I wouldn't probably spend a ton of time trying to engage people that they're like, actually, it's not relevant for me. I would actually spend more time really delivering for those that it's really relevant for and making fans even more super fans. And then by proxy of doing that, I believe it would then create some engagement for those other people rather than focusing on that. And I think when you do public speaking, you think about like, there's always like the hecklers as they say, or people that, you know, disagree. And you might even have these people in your life. It's like, you can spend all your time trying to argue or satisfy them or you can spend your time on where your message is really landing and double down there. Yeah, I agree with that. That often happens where you can just go ahead and ignore the people that aren't on board and focus on the people that are. And it's not always going to happen, but every once in a while, those people that weren't on board, when they see that traction happening, they're going to look over there and say, hey, what's going on over there? <laughs> oh, I didn't think there was anything to that, but it seems like there's something there now that I see. It's sort of taking advantage of the you know, our desire to be in a group. And I think when there's not a lot of people involved, it's hard to get people who are very resistant to get involved. But once they see a group of people having some success with something or enjoying it, that, that, then they're more likely to take part. Totally. And the other thing I'll say too, is it's important. Like I think dissonance or lack of agreement is so important. I see so many people like... I disagree, <laughs> but that's... Yeah, <laughs> well, right. <laughs> I, no. uh, <laughs> It's just kidding. Okay. And I, it's so good though. But I like, you know, and I find some of the times where I've actually gone to people who have been like, I totally don't agree with what you're saying. Or like, this isn't for me. And then actually just give them the space to be like, like, I'd love to hear more about your experience or like, tell me more about it and actually bring the voice, not like shut it off or pretend it's not there, but like actually allow it to be included in the space. Oftentimes like creates an opening, not only for themselves, but the entire group. And so I think like all of it is, is valuable, I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, I do find like, you know, competing ideas can lead to healthy discussions. And it's also important to focus like what's the real intention here. And so it's, I think, an art of, of bringing that all in. But I don't want to <laughs> go too far down that rabbit hole for the sake of this conversation. So I'll, I'll just reiterate that's one of several times this same idea has come up with, with our guests. And that is, you know, don't focus on selling the people that, that you have to convert when you're, especially when you're starting a project, just go for the people who are enthusiastic. It'll, it's better for everyone. So it's, it's good to hear a recurring theme come up. Other thing I just want to share real quick before we start wrapping up is this is a good thing for those people that are in a corporate environment and are looking to sort of find a way out of it. 
but maybe take advantage of their involvement in a corporate environment. So I could see someone taking your advice of trying to organizing this type of event within the business they're in to try to, you know, raise the level of people's emotional engagement and having that be a nice transitional move for them from being a corporate employee to doing their own projects. Yeah, absolutely. And I also say too, you don't even have to be the talent or the person who would host or create the event. Maybe your skill is just actually in providing the support and the infrastructure where you've got the relationships and you say, hey, you know, you you partner with the talent. Like you come to up someone like myself and you're like, Jules, I want to bring you into my corporate training or whatever. Can we partner on this? Or someone like me, for example, on a specific area and then create a, a joint venture together and you take care of all of like the operations and the logistics of it. And then you bring the talent in and then you both get to rock it out. The talent doesn't have to worry about the logistics and then you don't have to worry about the talent. And then you guys both make a bunch of money. So it's another idea as well to, to throw in that. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, Jules, thank you so much for your time. You've given us a lot to think about here. Very full conversation. Listeners, if you are on board with this idea, this concept, or even just want to try and get a chance to talk to Jules, email us with the actions that you've taken as a result of this podcast. Everyone who responds will gain access to a private Facebook group of action takers. And one lucky listener will earn a free mentoring session from Jules. And potentially, you guys can set up a business partnership. Also, at this point, we've recorded a couple dozen episodes, and we want to hear from you on what you like and what you don't like. Feel free to email us at update at runwithit.fm, and we may be able to get your questions or your feedback on air. Jules, we'll turn it back to you. Where can people find out more about you and what else would you like to leave our listeners with? Well, I imagine if you're listening to this podcast that you like podcasts, so you can search Unconventional Life on iTunes. We've got over 200 episodes of people from all over the world telling their stories um, about how they've done what they've done. So you can check out iTunes Unconventional Life there. You can also go to unconventionallifeshow.com. We've got our next event happening for the 2020 Eclipse in December in Patagonia which is going to be a really incredible experience, total solar eclipse. So if you want to get behind the screen and actually come join in in person, um, you know, you can check out the website uh, at unconventionallifeshow.com to learn more there. And then lastly, um, I take all of this kind of conversation and set it to music as well and just did a huge album in Canada and releasing a bunch of stuff this next year. So if music's your thing, com, you can check out some of my stuff there. And um, my parting words for all of you is really acknowledging you for being in this conversation. I think it takes something to say or even think about wanting to do something and then something else to actually make it all the way to the end of an episode. Or maybe you're loving these guys and you listen to every single one of their episodes or somewhere in between. Um, that it, it really takes something to keep keep playing and uh, just keep going is the last thing that I'll say. Like it doesn't stop. the The call doesn't end. It just gets louder or comes out in a different way. And the only way you fail is when you don't stay in the game. So keep playing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jules. Looking forward to continuing the conversation later on. And listeners, get out there and and run with it. Now it's time for you to run with it. Follow through on the action steps discussed and email a summary of what you did to update at runwithit.fm. Every listener who emails us will gain exclusive access to a private Facebook group of action takers. And one listener will earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Help us build the Run With It community of generous entrepreneurs. Please like, subscribe, and review us online. And remember, the secret of getting ahead is getting started.